So, welcome everybody, <laughs> welcome to Lea Uppi, and uh, as I said, uh, Lea is a professor of political theory at London School of Economics and has before that been a postdoctoral fellow at Nuffield College and uh, did her PhD at uh, the university, European University Institute at Florence and has written an, uh, extensively about normative political theory, like democratic theory, theories of justice, issues of migration, territorial rights, enlightenment political thought, especially Kant, Marxism and critical theory, etc., etc., and published a number of books. For example, Migration Political Theory, that's an edited book, and also The Architectonic of Reasons. That's how I usually introduce Lea. But of course, now we have this book <laughs> that has come out, and it has been an enormous success and pushed you up to the stratosphere of in the uh, international fame and it's been uh, uh, nominated to several prizes and picked as the best book at uh, you know, Financial Times, I think New York Times, and also recently, perhaps not as important, but the uh, Svenska Dagbladet here in Sweden. So that, that's quite a spectacular breakthrough, to put it the least. How does that feel like? Going from being uh, like in the well-known in the ivory tower and now becoming this star. Well, I guess you have to enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother used to say nothing lasts forever, and she had some experience of that, and I think I'm always mindful of that, so it's kind of nice while it's going, but I'm always thinking about the next project, actually. So it's um, That's good. A and did you expect it to be this kind of... Uh, no, not at all. No, I mean, I knew it was... Um, I knew I was stretching myself out of the boundaries of standard conventional political theory and mm -hmm. I was hoping for generosity from my fellow academics <laughs> and for some understanding that it was okay to <laughs> kind of push the boundary a little bit and still be taken seriously somehow. But on the other hand, I was also very mindful that I was writing on a very, um, that the context in which my ideas were applied were very narrow and that not many people really knew about Albania or had any reason to care about Albania because it wasn't in the kind of headline news. This was even before, you know, s to some extent, Ukraine and Russia has brought some attention to the Cold War. But when the book came out, this was even before that. So, um, so uh, yeah, I didn't expect people to be interested. I mm. certainly didn't take it for granted <laughs> that we, they would be interested in, in Albania and, and my Albanian story. So I was hoping for some nice reviews every here and now, <laughs> here and then, but here and there and every now and then. But uh, yeah, I no. would wasn't expecting it. So we're going to talk about a uh, political philosophy, but uh, talking, so say, from the view of this book. A and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do spoiler alerts if you haven't yet read this fantastic book, but I it is amazing. And uh, there's a kind of dramatic shift in the book that I will try to warn you so you have to put your hands over your ears when I'm talking about that. But one thing that is, is uh, quite interesting is your the political characters of your family. Uh, your mother and your father and your grandfather and the great-grandfather, they have quite a political spectrum there. Could you tell me more about that? Um, yeah, so they were all, as far as the Albanian communist state was concerned, they were all class enemies. Mm. So that was what brought them together. But they were different kinds of class enemy. So my great-grandfather was the in some ways the most problematic one from the point of view of Albanian communist state because he had been prime minister of Albania and had also been regent of the king at the point in which Italians invaded Albania and he was pivotal in handing over the crown of Albania to the fascists and so from the communist historiography he was a traitor the equivalent of a kind of quisling figure or I don't know the Marshal Pétain the kind of if you think about the Vichy government collaborator government he was uh, he had been really central to that transition and had been the first to go and greet Vittorio Emanuele and so on in history books as that his son who was my great uh, who, so this was my great grandfather his son who was my grandfather was a socialist he was uh, he studied in France in Paris and he had been in the Popular Front and in fact had been at some point close to being arrested when he came to Albania in the 30s because while his father was in government who was a conservative politician the son was distributing Marxist leaflets and socialist leaflets to Albania so had been in, in trouble with 
this, but then he also, because he was a socialist but not a communist, ended up being arrested um, after the war and when the Communist Party came to power, and so he spent 15 years in prison. My mom is comes from a um, property holding family, so landowners and, and you know bourgeoisie. So li this side of the family is more kind of aristocratic, constitutional regime. So that's why I say they were all class enemies, but they had class differences between them. And so this side were more, as I say, cultural aristocratic elite, and this other side were more bourgeois. So my mom was um, came from this family, and she was the one whose political beliefs in some ways were most aligned with her class belonging, because she was a libertarian, um, that Thatcherite, who was uh, always very opposed to communism and when eventually c gained her freedom in the 90s when the state completely changed and she was constantly chasing her properties after that from the thing the memory i have of my mother from 91 was of she really had this nausicaan idea of whatever is transferred in a just way and exactly. is just and it sounds like nausicaan when you read her the robin nausicaan is famous american someone worked hard to to gain a title to this property and then if they gain title in the rightful way then they can transfer it and if they transfer it in the rightful way then it belongs to you and so for her the gr the biggest injustice that had been done in communist albania was this kind of affront to property and my dad uh, s her husband was the um he was not a right was not right wing he was more in the book for for sweets this would kind of resonate but one of his biggest heroes was olof palme and in fact, he loved every left-wing revolutionary, provided they were dead. Yeah, usually. That <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, um, but no, no, he no, had no this kind ones. of fascination with like uh, characters. Well, this is also partly why he really uh, he had a period in which he used to call me when I was little brigatista, and I didn't mm. know what it was. But he had a period of fascination with the Red Brigades in Italy, not because he agreed with revolutionary violence or anything like that, but mostly because at the point in which he had this fascination, they were all in prison or dead as well. And so he kind of um, admired their revolutionary effort. And I feel because of the way he felt trapped in communist Albania, this gave him a vision of an alternative way of being critical of the system. And so it was kind of, he was, I'd say, borderline anarchist, radical social democrat, a kind of mixture of... Maybe a bit skeptical, pragmatic, a bit uh, you know, you have to try things out, but you don't really know But how usually it he, I mean, he was very critical of everything that existed. But whenever something that existed materialized, then he also became critical. And so he was never for something. He was always against something. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so maybe that will happen. I mean, that's quite a fascinating uh, environment. Of course, some of these people were present in your home and you grew up and you talked about these people, but uh, of course, a bit carefully. I mean, for the longest time, we're going to get back to that. Of course, you it wasn't official who your great grandfather was but but you said that your m mother was like uh, mostly connected to so say to her class background but i mean she wasn't a conservative she was a libertarian which is kind yeah, of revolutionary yeah. in one way so yeah absolutely <laughs> i mean and certainly in albania in during communism that was revolutionary yeah. um, but she she concealed that and i had no idea that my mother had actually any political interest until the system changed mm. before that the only thing I remember and associate with her was that she was constantly didn't want to watch Albanian news. So unlike my father and my grandmother, who always uh, realized somehow, but although I didn't know at the time that this was state propaganda, but still listened to it, my mother had, had this inherent hostility. She wouldn't even try and take the propaganda. Mm. So, And because she felt that everything was filtered through communist propaganda, she just completely was disinterested in, in the... Um, in news or in anything that seemed to be political. I, my memory of her when I was little was I was, she was always watching Dynasty and Dallas and never because she was interested in the plot or the characters. In fact, she didn't know who the characters were. She was only interested in the furniture because it was uh. a kind of a, a, another vision of another society. And but so but to get Dynasty and Dallas, you have to get uh, Italian television yeah. then and go yeah, up yeah, on yeah, the yeah, roof. Exactly, and do yeah, this yeah, yeah, this was not an Albanian television, but this was for us the window to the Western world mm. where these kind of soap operas and in some ways also a slightly deceptive window because you thought that every house in the West was like Dynasty and Dallas and if you went to the West, you would have a house like yeah. that as well. And so, yeah. um, Good, so, so um, yeah, so uh, I guess the discussions at home was quite fierce at times, but not during the communist rule, because then they talked in a kind of code language, but after, and when this big rupture came, then it really came out, this kind of different views. Yeah, I mean, during communism, they spoke about politics, but in a way that I didn't understand was about politics. Mm. So they had a kind of code language that they were speaking to each other. And there were these memories, there were these moments in my childhood where I felt that m something about my parents' stance to the system 
was a bit weird. So one of them, for example, was when Enver Hoxha died. Mm. And I remember I was still at nursery, but I had a very vivid memory of being five and a half years old and uh, going home after he had died. And we had been told at nursery, this is like the most tragic day in the history of Albania since the Second World War. And, you know, it will take a long time for the country to recover. And of course, it's an atheist country, so you can't tell children that there is an afterworld. It was all about once you're dead, you're dead. So it was just like you had to come to terms with this. And then, then there was a funeral on television, and I remember at some point they w we were all watching the funeral, and I was literally crying because it was so sad. And I remember at some point my parents started having an argument about the music that was being played in the funeral. So my mom was like, oh, this is Heroica from Beethoven, and my dad was like, no, this is an Albanian composer. And my mom was like, oh, you have no idea about classical music. <laughs> and my dad, so they started having this fight, and I remember thinking, this is so strange, someone died, and we were told this is like a horrible day for the country, and all they can think about is talk about the music <laughs> in the funeral and have this kind of massive argument about the music. So, And I didn't know that that expressed any political views, but certainly then these political debates became really lively after 1990, and my mom, because she, in some ways, her dream, her love, her, her, her ideal system, became realized after 1990, she was really bossy because she felt like she had to defend the system. And my dad, who was critical of every system, was kind of angry, and sh he was also angry with the system that came after. So he didn't like communism, but he also didn't like what came afterwards. And so it was always these very big fights, like my mom was saying to my dad, you know, you're not entrepreneurial enough because you're not taking a driving license and you're not buying a car. And my dad was like, but the car is bad for the environment. And my mom was like, well, what about Chernobyl and the environment? So they had these kind of petty fights <laughs> about <laughs> everything. and. Um, and but usually they were reflective of their political differences. I'm going to ask you to read a piece. I, I was actually going to ask you to read the immigration immigration bit, but I think we we can come back to them because it fits more to read that little part about the, the the conversations about studying, graduating, jumping out from different universities. Mm -hmm. If you didn't mind reading, that. and this I warn you is a spoiler alert if you don't want to hear it. So this is the point at which my parents in the um, 1990, when the system changed, discovered or revealed to me who they were and what these conversations that they had, these secret conversations mm. they had were, were about. In the following days, the first opposition party was founded and my parents revealed the truth, their truth. They said that my country had been an open air prison for almost half a century. That the universities which had haunted my family were, yes, educational institutions, but of a peculiar kind. They always spoke about people graduating. And, uh, that when my family spoke of the graduation of relatives, what they really meant was their release from prison. That completing a degree was coded language for completing a sentence. That what had been referred to as the initials of university towns were actually the initials of various prison and deportation sites. B for Burel, M for Malich, S for Spach, that the different subjects of study corresponded to different official charges. To study international relations meant to be charged with treason. Literature stood for agitation and propaganda. And a degree in economics entailed a more minor crime, like hiding gold. That students who became teachers were former prisoners who converted to being spies, like our cousin and his late wife. That a harsh professor was an official at whose hands many people had lost their lives, like Haki, with whom my grandfather had shaken hands after serving his sentence. That if someone had achieved excellent results, it meant that stint had been brief and straightforward. But being expelled meant a death sentence. And dropping out voluntarily, like my grandfather's best friend in Paris, meant committing suicide. I learned that the former prime minister whom I had grown up despising and whose name my father bore did not have the same name and surname by, by coincidence. He was my great-grandfather. That's it. I think I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite something. How did you... F I mean, you were 11 years at the time when this revelation came? Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest mystery about this had been this teacher of my grandfather's. I was constantly, he was constantly referred to as a teacher. Mm. So this was someone, because they spoke about universities, this was someone who had been the person who was actually torturing him ah. in prison, someone called Haki. And, oh, Haki, yeah. and mm. the story was that, that was constantly told and constantly revisited in my family was that after my grandfather had finished se his sentence, he wrote to Enver Hoxha, whom he knew from his Paris days, because mm. they were friends in Paris, they were both in the Popular Front, one was in the Socialist Party, the other was in the Communist Party, and said, look, I've done 15 years in prison, I need a job. And he got a job, actually. And then at some point in his job, he encountered this policeman uh, or pr prison guard who was Haki, and 
shook hands with him and the guy needed, this policeman needed a um, favor from him and he didn't even charge him for the favor and kind of gave him the document that was and uh, he needed some kind of haki, exactly. Mm. So basically the story was that my grandfather had met a teacher from his university days and everyone who came spoke about this and said, how can he shake hands with his teacher? And I as a child remember thinking, what's wrong with shaking hands with your teacher? And everybody kept home mm. and started talk mm. asking my grandmother, like, did he not know what Haki had done? But how could he do? How could he do? It? Did he not know how many people Haki failed? Did he not know how harsh he was? And how did he f did he uh, forgive him afterwards? And my grandmother constantly said, well, you know, he was a teacher, but everybody was a teacher. It's not really about the teacher; it's about the rector. And so they had these kind of constant discussions around authority, which I remembered as being completely perplexing because I didn't understand what was a big deal because the university to me was a university mm. or a school. And in fact, it turned out to be something very deep about forgiving and about the fact that my grandmother and my grandfather both both had this attitude to, to communism, which is not still not common in Albania, mm. which is to say, look, this was l the past and people did things because they were forced. And if you don't forgive, then you can't move forward. And, and uh, yeah, and this was something that was not well understood. But did they like at one day sat you down and say this is the way it is, or how did it happen? No, it was a series of revelations over mm. a progressive uh, uh, over a period of time. It wasn't like one day, all of it at once. It was something like first, do you remember? I think the prison stuff was the first one. So first they said, you know, when we talked about universities, these were actually prisons. And when we said your grandfather had done a research in in a university town, he had actually been to this prison. And then, of course, because I was coming out of communist state propaganda, for me, I didn't understand. I was 11. I didn't understand how someone can go to prison for no reason or for political reason. Because when you're a child, I don't think you really understand what a political crime is. So for me, prison having been brought up in communism and with communist ideology, prison was where thieves go, basically. I had no idea that political prisons existed. Mm -hmm. So they had to sit me down and explain this idea of a kind of crime of conscience. And from then, then they started build it up, built up. And, and then my grandmother was telling me about the tortures and about uh, that what she had done and how she had to go and uh, bring food to my grandfather and write met messages to him on the pans and mm. all these things that people do who have experience of prisons that need to pass political messages. And um, yeah. But how was it for you? I mean, when you realize, I mean, you were had grown up in the system and you know, completely imbued and believed in it, and then suddenly. At the age of el 11, it's just tumbling apart. And yeah, it, it was kind of, I, it really was, com for me, I don't remember any trauma as in emotional trauma. Mm. I certainly remember thinking, why did they not trust me that they could tell these things to me? Like I felt I was a sort of clever child who could be trusted to mm. keep a secret. And, um, but other than that, it really felt like I had recently, last year I had a conversation with my oldest child about Santa. <laughs> and he <laughs> said to me, you lied to me for all these years and you told me Santa doesn't exist. And, and I had to tell, and then I went through the hoops because as a philosopher, I tried saying, well, Santa has metaphysical reality, but not <laughs> empirical <laughs> reality. And, and I was trying to convince, but of course my parents couldn't even say that communism had metaphysical <laughs> reality because they didn't even buy into the metaphysical reality. But I remember having this conversation about why did you not trust me and trust my intellect mm. and my capacity to understand this and to keep the secret and you know like my son was something to, I, yeah, I would still play along with my siblings and I would still keep it for you and I could still keep the secret for the little ones and so mm. on and then I also remember that the because the language changed that was the part that took longer you know this idea that you're in this state that is controlled by the party the party is responsible for everything you're building communism and you're building the dictatorship of the proletariat and suddenly you're told look communism is rubbish the dictatorship of the proletariat is gone and you you were you always thought you were fighting the class enemy but actually you are the class enemy and you would mm. always have stayed the class enemy nobody has going was going to accept you in the party so that shattered the whole system of values in a way the whole hierarchy and had to be replaced with new concepts and that was what when i look at the diary now and um and see what kind of notes i made it's all about i was told that the party is bad and i was told that we're not fighting for the dictatorship of the proletariat anymore but we're fighting for political pluralism and mm. i was told that now we have civil society we will have civil society so all these concepts were replaced by new concepts that entered the political scene and the ideological vocabulary very quickly and had to be mastered also. Mm. But, but did any concepts stay like free? Freedom was 
Vietnam was the only one that kind of stayed, but then it didn't mean the freedom of the collective anymore. No. It meant the freedom of individuals, like free individual initiative and enterprise, and um, and uh, and that was the one that I then reflecting. I mean, when I was a child, I didn't really think about the asymmetries of freedom, but that was certainly when I was writing the book. That was the one thing that I felt had stayed, and that was also in part why I wrote this book about freedom, mm. where I wanted to articulate how one thing is the moral belief in freedom and another thing is how it gets packaged ideologically and interpreted by a political system and how in both cases in both political systems freedom had been both packaged in a certain way but also there were instances of oppression that were clearly there and that the ideological packaging made very difficult to see and I felt that was the case in both systems actually and mm. this is one so of the, the term stayed free but it really yeah I mean content Quite dramatically. Yeah, that that was the the time where I remember thinking about this was when I this opening scene in the book, which is the hugging of Stalin and mm. so on, where I ended up in this protest and there were these protesters shouting freedom and democracy, and I remember thinking, why are they shouting freedom and democracy? We've already got freedom and we've already got democracy. Mm. So what do they want? And and then you know when I went home and I realized that my parents were really taking an interest in the protests and in the changes and so on. That's that was the point where it dawned on me that maybe it wasn't what we had but what some kind of distant other thing that we had to acquire and but certainly stayed there and, and certainly the rhetoric of freedom then in the 90s was really powerful and uh, and shaped how a lot of things were read and also how a lot of things that went wrong were absolved as wrongs in a mm. way which including freedom of movement including kind of um, all the shock therapy and the consequences of shock therapy and people losing their jobs and um, people making investments that all went uh, wrong because of the fraudulent pyramid schemes that everybody had put money in the 90s and then eventually collapsed and that was also these were all instances of freedom so you know the idea that you invest and save money this was supposed to be expressive of freedom and again I remember my parents with their different political views my mom w we were trying to decide whether to put money in these companies in the financial schemes and my mom was saying, well, we have to save money and then we invest it and that's how money gets multiplied. And my dad was saying, well, what happens with everyone wants their money back? And my mom was saying, well, why would everyone want their money back? <laughs> Do you think in the West everyone goes and says we want the, all our money back right now, all mm -hmm. at once? I mean, in the West it would also collapse if everybody went and said we want our money back. But they won't do it because, you know, this mm -hmm. is the system. And so if you believe in the system, then you kind of uphold its norms. And of course in Albania it didn't work like that. And eventually everyone did want their money back and it did all yeah. collapse. But, but that's a funny case where she believed actually in some kind of state upholding when so it wasn't the state, it was the it was the market. Yeah, it market, was the kind exactly. of invisi invisible hand yeah. of the market. The idea that there was the belief that we all do things, and then the market distributes in the right way. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, when then when he challenged her and said, "Well, what if it doesn't work?" She was saying, "Well, why would it not work?" And yeah. We used to keep all our savings in my grandfather's coat. Mm. And I remember Very this, we wise. had this kind of one <laughs> coat pocket <laughs> where all, because we didn't really have savings in communist Albania, we had these schemes of solidarity with mm. the work workplace lottery, what was called the workplace lottery, but it wasn't really a lottery. If somebody needed to make an investment that was a bit more than what they would afford with their monthly savings, then the whole collective or everyone who worked together pulled money and then the next month somebody else did it and somebody else did it. So there were these mutual kind of microfinance almost schemes, but with no lender and it was just kind of collective resource. And then from there we went from that kind of model to a model where we had a financial system and we had banks mm. and we had enterprises and um D did it shake your mom's belief uh, your mother's belief in markets when this came down and did she acknowledge to your father that he was right no because she uh, because the other part of this that is very interesting is a developmental paradigm so mm. for her it was the fact that these were corrupt albanians who hadn't done things the way they should be done and so this is the other thing with every system there is an ideal and there is a reality and every time you can always find ways of saying the reality is not good compared to the ideal mm. and that applies to both communism and liberalism actually so in, in liberalism there's a lot of things that go wrong but you can say well this wasn't the real free market economy you mm -hmm. know it's because the state mingled or it's because it wasn't checked uh, because there were some things weren't done some people were corrupt some people didn't act according to their uh, proper incentives 
So the fallout in every system, I think, can be justified. I mean, you can think about, I don't know, people, the fact, I always say, some people say, to me, well, we get back, talk to this maybe after, but when people say, you know, how can you still be a socialist after all the horrible reality? Mm. And I sometimes, well, how are people still Catholics after the, Catholic, the, the Crusades? Mm. It's kind of similar, you know, every system of beliefs has a, 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 an ideal and a dream and then a fallout from that dream. And it's uh, we We'll get back to that. But I thought, I mean, you were talking about free and how that uh, term was used, but the content changed. Um, I thought we should talk about another part which will kind of change. We're going to talk about uh, something you've also done research on, immigration and immigration. I'm going to ask you to read a piece from that part. So, again, this is from a chapter that uh, is in the second part of the book and that starts at the point in which this way Albania is confronted with these waves of immigration. Everyone wants to leave, I wrote in my diary, commenting on the events of March and August 1991. Everyone except us. Most of our friends and relatives spent days, weeks, even months planning how they would leave. There was a wide range of possibilities. Falsifying documents, hijacking boats, crossing the land border, applying for a visa, finding a Westerner who could invite you and guarantee your stay, borrowing money. People hardly gave thought to the purpose. Knowing how you would get somewhere was more important than knowing why. For some, leaving was a necessity that went under the official name of transition. We were a society in transition, it was said, moving from socialism to liberalism, from one party rule to pluralism, from one place to the other. Opportunities would never come to you unless you went looking for them. Unle uh, like the uh, half cockerel in the old Albanian folk tale who travels far away looking for his kismet and in the end returns full of gold. For others, leaving the country was an adventure, a childhood dream come true or a way to please their parents. There were those who left and never returned, those who went and came back soon after, those who turned the organization of movement into a profession, who opened travel agencies or smuggled people on boats, those who survived and became rich, those who survived and continued to struggle and those who died trying to cross the border. In the past, one would have been arrested for wanting to leave. Now that nobody was stopping us from emigrating, we were no longer welcome on the other side of the border. The only thing that had changed was the color of police uniforms. We risked being arrested not in the name of our own government, but in the name of other states, those same governments who used to urge us to break free in the past. The West had spent decades criticizing the East for its closed borders, funding campaigns to demand freedom of movement, condemning the immorality of states committed to restricting the right to exit. Our exiles used to be received as heroes. Now, they were treated like criminals. Perhaps freedom of movement had never really mattered. It was easy to defend it when someone else was doing the dirty work of imprisonment. But what value does the right to exit have if there is no right to enter? Were borders and walls reprehensible only when they served to keep people in, as opposed to keeping them out? The border guards, the patrol boats, the detention and repression of immigrants that were pioneered in Southern Europe for the first time in those years would become standard practice over the coming decades. The West, initially unprepared for the arrival of thousands of people wanting a different future, would soon perfect a system for excluding the most vulnerable and attracting the more skilled all the while defending their way of life. And yet, those who sought to emigrate did so because they were attracted to that way of life. Far from posing a threat to the system, they were its most ardent supporters. Hmm. So that's the paradox of this uh, long-term criticism of uh, countries, kind of like the Ronald Reagan said, tear down that wall, uh, this criticism. And then there was there was kind of a like with Albania too, a half a year when you actually could, you could leave, and then it actually started to be closed again, but from the outside. So now yeah. keeping people out, as as you say in the book, and and this is something you also you've been writing about the, the justice. Would you like to tell you more about your views about this? Well, I mean, I think I when I started writing about this, I was struck, and I started writing about.
before I thought about my personal connection to mm -hmm. these things. So it's one of these things that you got interested in a topic and then you discover that there is a biographical or historical <laughs> or genealogical mm -hmm. reason why you were interested in this topic. But when I started writing and working on freedom on immigration debates in contemporary political theory, one of the things that really struck me was this uh, so-called asymmetry debate. So the idea that the freedom to leave is more important than the freedom to enter. Mm. And you know, in, in political theory debates on migration, people will say, of course, the state has a right to restrict its borders when people are trying to come into it. But they don't have a right to restrict the borders if, you know, people are trying to leave the state. So there is an asymmetry between the right to enter and the right to exit. And I remember thinking when I started doing this research, thinking, well, we are only the argument here is freedom and freedom of movement. So we care about freedom of movement. If you care about freedom of movement, there are two components. There is an exit component and an enter component. So if you think freedom of movement matters, surely it matters in both cases. It doesn't matter whether you're leaving or you're entering, and it doesn't matter by what mechanisms you are stopping people from doing so. Whether I shoot my own citizens at the border, or I create a system of surveillance and a kind of dismantling of and patrolling, or I pay the local uh, militias to try and <coughs> protect immigrants and make sure that they don't come into my borders. Mm. That's kind of irrelevant because at the end, the freedom of movement of people is not there. And if you're a system that values freedom and is built on upholding this value of freedom, that surely has to trouble you. But I was always really surprised that this argument actually very hardly cut with my fellow liberal political theorists, <laughs> that I made this case in my mm. research. Mm. And I felt this it seemed completely obvious to me that you know, and I again, I had the example of the wall and, and Albania and shooting people at the border. And I, th I felt, well, that was horrible. And everybody used to tell us they w that were ho horrible and they were right to tell us that it was mm. horrible. So now if I kind of go back and think about what was done to my fellow Albanians when they were trying to enter somewhere, then why does that not strike people as equally horrible? And Do you think because they, they think about it in terms of a club? So a club, you know, you can have a discretion what members you let in. Yeah, uh, you but might also actually have discussion of throwing people out, but that's not so much discussed about the right of throwing right, people out. Right, right, right. But not so much this idea that... They yeah, I know. mean, it's true. But then on the other hand, the kind of club analogy is founded on exclusive values, yes. right? So if you think about a football club, well, you mm. know, we can't let people who don't play football because they can't, they don't, they're not professional football players, mm -hmm. let's say. So, of course, you know, if you're playing a football game, then someone from the stadium can't say, well, I'm just going to come and play the game. But that's because that's founded on rules that are inherently exclusive. But the rules on which liberal states are founded are not, in, are not inherently exclusive rules. These are universally inclusive rules. And the value of that system is protected on the idea, is based on the idea that rules are inclusive. And this is an mm. inclusive system. And that's what makes it superior to other systems, that it is universal and it praises freedom and it praises all these other great things that we all want. So then how does that system, from being universal and inclusive, how does that then become the metaphor of the club? Mm -hmm. Why are you then defending it as a club? And this again, I mean, you know, we have these debates in political theory yeah, all the time, but that's what I always found with liberal political theorists. When you pressed on them, I said, but this is a universal value. So it's the burden of the state to justify itself on whether it serves this value or not. And if it doesn't, then the system needs to be rethought and revisited and uh, revised. So You're a Kant scholar. So if you go back if to, to the older discussion of about immigration, immigration, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. Actually, the first discussion was about whether you had a right to emigrate. But you didn't think it was any problem that people immigrated because then you saw people as resources. Well, yeah. I mean, some of these debates, so going back to Kant, for example, some of the really interesting debates in kind of Kantian philosophy are actually about the right to hospitality. Mm. So people forget that the cosmopolitan right for Kant is in the first instance a right to hospitality. What they also forget is that what the right to hospitality meant then was the right to interact with colonizing peoples in a certain way. So this whole debate around emigration and immigration back in the days in the kind of 19th century, when it was defended, it meant if there is a commercial company from Europe coming to your borders and wanting to make deals with you, then you, know, you should let them access your territory and your resources. So this argument historically was used in completely in, in a function that actually served to promote European commercial extension into non-European parts of the world. And and in fact, Kant then urged this kind of right to hospitality, saying you can't be hostile, but of course the people who visit you, who are the colonizers, they also have to not manipulate and not dominate you and sign contracts with you that mm. you understand. Because one of the problems with colonialism was that, you know, the Westerners went there and said, we have a contract here, could you please sign it? And people couldn't read the contract, didn't understand what the contract was because they didn't have a culture of contract signing as property mm. relations and so on. So usually they signed this contract and they, after a few years, they discovered that they sold themselves into slavery. So <laughs> and this was the pattern of 
kind of European commercial relations with the rest of the world. But again, it was then the, the rhetoric was, re was, was turned its, its axe because then these people who were first colonized after decolonization then became emigrants and immigration was in some ways the result of this interaction with the non-Western world. And in fact, it's not a coincidence that the majority of immigrants to Western Europe are from former colonies or from mm, peripheries of the world. But somehow the, the, the connection of migration to historical injustice is not often made. And the, very the way in which categories that are connected to migration are also connected to that colonial history also is often missed. Uh, I should mention that Leah has written a book on Kant and colonialism, which I very much recommend. It says more about this. I, I thought we should now turn to, actually to the epilogue. Uh, you know, when you speak about your experience to uh, Western Marxists, so you could read that part of the book or a little bit of it. Yep, okay. So, each year I begin my Marx courses at the London School of Economics by telling students that many people think of socialism as a theory of material relations, class struggle or economic justice, but that in reality something more fundamental animates it. Socialism, I tell them, is above all a theory of human freedom, of how to think about progress in history, of how we adapt to circumstances but also try to rise above them. Freedom is not sacrificed only when others tell us what to say, where to go, how to behave. A society that claims to enable people to realize their potential but fails to change the structures that prevent everyone from flourishing is also oppressive. And yet, despite all the constraints, we never lose our inner freedom, the freedom to do what is right. I'll skip a paragraph here and uh, I'll talk about, that in th there is this paragraph in which I talk about how my mother gained her properties back suddenly. And I thought, because my mother gained her properties back, I no longer needed to count my last pennies until the next scholarship installment. I was a student in Italy. I could enjoy meals out and drink late in bars, discussing politics with my new university friends. Many of those friends were self-declared socialists. Western socialists, that is. They spoke about Rosa Luxemburg, Leon Trotsky, Salvador Allende or Ernesto Che Guevara as secular saints. It occurred to me that they were like my father in this respect. The only revolutionaries they considered worthy of admiration had been murdered. These icons showed up on posters, t-shirts and coffee cups, much like the way photos of Enver Hoxha would show up in people's living rooms when I was growing up. When I pointed this out, my friends wanted to know more about my country. But they did not think that my stories from the 80s were in any way significant to their political beliefs. Sometimes my appropriating the label of socialist to describe both my experiences and their commitments was considered a dangerous provocation. We used to go to a large open-air concert in Rome for 1st May, and I could not help but reminisce about the parades of my childhood on Workers' Day. What you had was not really socialism, they would say, barely concealing their irritation. My stories about socialism in Albania and references to all the other socialist countries against which our socialism had measured itself were at best tolerated as the embarrassing remarks of a foreigner still learning to integrate. The Soviet Union, China, the German Democratic Republic, Yugoslavia, Vietnam, Cuba. There was nothing socialist about them either. They were seen as the deserving losers of a historical battle that the real, authentic bearers of that title had yet to join. My friend's socialism was clear, bright, and in the future. Mine was messy, bloody, and of the past. And yet the future they sought, and that which socialist states had once embodied, found inspiration in the same books, the same critiques of society, the same historical characters, but to my surprise, they treated this as an unfortunate coincidence. Everything that went wrong on my side of the world could be explained by the cruelty of our leaders or the uniquely backward nature of our institutions. They believed there was little for them to learn. There was no risk of repeating the same mistakes, no reason to ponder what had been achieved and why it had been destroyed. Their socialism was characterized by the triumph of freedom and justice, mine by their failure. Their socialism would be brought about by the right people, with the right motives, under the right circumstances, with the right combination of theory and practice. <laughs>
There was only one thing to do about mine. Forget it. But I was reluctant to forget. It's not that I felt nostalgic. It's not that I romanticized my childhood. It's not that the concepts I had grown up with were so deeply rooted in me that it was impossible to disentangle myself. But if there wasn't one lesson to take away from the history of my family and of my country, it was that people never make history under circumstances they choose. It's easy to say, what you had was not the real thing, applying that to socialism or liberalism, to any complex hybrid of ideas and reality. It releases us from the burden of responsibility. We are no longer complicit in moral tragedies created in the name of great ideas, and we don't have to reflect, apologize, and learn. We're doing a reading group on Das Kapital, a friend told me one day. If you join it, you will learn about real socialism. <laughs> and so I did. When I read the opening pages of the preface, it felt a bit like hearing French, a foreign language I had been taught as a child but rarely practiced. I remembered many of the key words, capitalists, workers, landlords, values, profit, and they echoed inside my head in the voice and simplified formulations of my teachers. Individuals, Marx wrote in the opening pages, are dealt with only insofar as they are the personifications of economic categories, embodiments of particular class relations and class interests. But for me, behind every personification of an economic category, there was the flesh and blood of a real person. Behind the capitalist and the landlord, there were my great-grandfathers. Behind the workers, there were the Roma who worked at the ports. Behind the peasants, the people with whom my grandmother was sent to work in the fields when my grandfather went to prison and about whom she still spoke condescendingly. It was impossible to finish reading and just move on. I'll just finish. There's something. So clearly you don't agree with this, um, not, not call it the Western Marxist. You think we can learn something from this experience. What is it that we th you think, is apart from the practical also, perhaps mm -hmm. from, uh, for, from the theoretical point of view, what is it that you think we can learn? I mean, I think there are uh, several levels at which one can, can pitch this conversation. So one is about the fact that there is a certain paternalism that is implicit in this attitude that discounts the experience of half of the world, no, which at one point uh, had gone some through some communism okay. and socialism. <laughs> and that goes without saying. And, kind of <laughs> and, and, and to think that you know this whole experience is the result of either, as I say, people's being backward or having bad leaders or um, you know, there's something there that needs to be teased out that goes beyond just saying this entire and because also because these socialist experiences were very different from each other. And so mm. to cluster them all as one package and to say, you know, communism is irrelevant, has nothing to tell us, nothing to teach us about history, about different economic models, about different models of society, about how ideas are translated into practice, just also ignores the tension between them. Yugoslavia was a very different thing from communist Albania. Hungary was a very different thing from the GDR. Cuba was a very different thing yet again. These are all, and, and yet, when you think about capitalism, you are always sensitive to the differences between the capitalist experiences. So you think, well, you know, I have something to learn from capitalism here in Sweden, and mm -hmm. I want to uh, think about capitalism in the United States in a very different way. And so these are all not, all, if you were to put them all in one box and went for the kind of lowest common denominator in the criticism, then you wouldn't learn anything about capitalism. It wouldn't tell you anything interesting. And I think something similar applies to the experiences of socialism. So the first plea was one for just being more open epistemically to this alternative reality of these alternative models and to the way in which these models um, were realized in different historical circumstances and, and in different societies. The second thing that was also really important for, from the perspective, so this is the problem I have with the West. There's another problem in the East, which is the opposite problem somehow. So in the East, is in, the, in the East you have the problem with the theory. So here you have a problem with the practice. In, in the West, the problem is that the theory is good, but the practice was bad. In the East, the opposite problem is true, which is that because all practice was bad, the theory is of no interest to us. Mm -hmm. And so that's why m one of my difficulties as a researcher of some of these questions, going back to Albania with my mother and so on, was that people just don't want to hear the name of Marx anymore. For them, Marx is a criminal, like Stalin. There's no difference between a political uh, figure and a philosopher. Mm. Uh, the philosophy is equally criminal. And yet, for me, uh, in my kind of research, in my biography, some of these texts were really important also to scrutinize the system in which we live. So there is something to learn from 
I, I think of philosophy as, you know, one um, a big library where you go and read the books that help you understand the world in which you live. And I felt that you can't take away from that library certain texts just because of the historical experiences. So while in the West the idea was we san sanctify and we turn into the canon of like Marx, this is why there, there is this joke about the reading group on Das Kapital. You're just like, when you have a problem with the world, what do you do? You create the Das Kapital reading group. And that's the kind of Western mm -hmm. attitude. In the East, you can't even mention Das Kapital. You mm -hmm. can't, you know, if you mention it, people get really angry. And I know this because I wrote this book and published it in Albania. And, you know, I had a serious abuse in terms of conversations and in terms of what you can say and you can't mm -hmm. say. And people trying to police, you know, how are you? You're now walking on the blood of your relatives just by mentioning these names and so on. And yet for me, it was quite important because it opened my eyes to a different way of thinking about society and, and capitalism. And I had to kind of overcome this obstacle with myself and with my family. I mean, I had, it, this was this kind of anecdote that's not mentioned in the book. I was studying philosophy in Italy. And for many years, I was avoiding the professors who did political philosophy in Rome were all Marxists and uh, kind of of this Italian communist Gramscian tradition, so Western Marxists mm. of, of the kind that I discuss in the book. But they always had Marx or Hegel in the syllabus. And for many years, I had an inherent aversion to this because of where I came from. So I was like, I'm doing political philosophy, but I'm not going to do Marx. I just don't want to know about it. And one year, there was political liberalism on the syllabus. So I was like, okay, this is the year for me to do political liberalism. But of course, it was taught by a Marxist professor who I didn't <laughs> know at the time. So, so I started taking this course, and it was all on Constant, Rousseau, mm -hmm. and criticism of Constant, and, and so on. And then you discover a way of thinking about this intellectual tradition, which was eye-opening, because among other things, it helped me make sense of many of the social problems that I had seen firsthand in Albania the pyramid scheme, mm. the borders issue, they're just kind of, it's a key, an interpretive key to the world that if you don't have access to that whole intellectual tradition, then you don't see the full picture. And so I think that was the, that's what the book is trying to say, and that's why it's trying to speak to both audiences in, in a way of mm. uh, thinking about theory and practice in this integrated way. And the other thing is that there is in every political system a question of dirty hands. And, uh, and, a qu and a question of kind of ethics that is impure. And that happens in every structure. So I, I don't believe that there are bad people. I think there are failures that are driven by historical complex phenomena and so on. And yet, whenever you discuss the failures of communist societies, they're always discussed as the failures of individuals. They're never discussed as what was missing in the structures. Mm. And so I think there's a really important debate to be had, for example, about the fact that in these societies, from an economic perspective, they experimented with models of alternative ownership, which I think are still important. But what they lacked was real democracy in terms of political freedom and freedom of uh, speech and liberal sort of first generation stuff. And I really don't think it's an out, out, it's an either or. If you don't have both of these components, then the system is bound to fail. And in, s in Eastern Europe, there was no attention to that, no attention to political democracy. And people who think that communism failed because it was not efficient economic system, I think they're wrong because there's something there about the absence of political freedom that really triggered the pro-democracy oh, so movement. You wouldn't say this uh, continuous association between the kind of real existing communism and planned economy? Well, I mean, is there rather than having a market economy, I mean, Yugoslavia experience. Well, exactly. Uh, so, yeah. So, so this is what I mean. So there, there were different models there. There were, mm. and, and you can learn from these models. So you can learn from, you know, fully planned economy versus more decentralized economy mm. versus socialist market economy. And when we study all these things and these alternative approaches to ownership, it seems to me that it's worth thinking about what was historically being done in particular contexts and how did this work and what worked and what didn't. But of course, if you put the whole experiences in one block and say they were all failures, then you don't learn anything because you don't engage them in a way that is productive for contemporary thinking. Uh, it's kind of interesting because you, you, you describe early in the book this kind of tourism, of this kind of tourists that were coming to look at uh, how does uh, this fantastic communist country work. And they were in mean, a bit blue-eyed in another way. And then after the walls come down, uh, there's this, you don't want to touch it. Yeah. So there's a, a real shift there. Yeah, exactly. No, absolutely. And yeah. what happened with those Westerners? That were well, I <laughs> mean, they <laughs> came back, but in the form of experts of the World Bank and IMF and yeah, the no, civil that society that activists. That yeah. And a lot of them had turned from but being... In, in fact, a number of civil society activists were former Marxist-Leninist party members, and they all turned into champions of human rights yeah. and democracy. But and I was uh, thinking about some... I, mean I don't mean it in an <laughs> offensive way. I'm sure they're like... Yeah, I was thinking about some of your professor, Marxist professor. They, I assume they're a bit older. They might have been part of that tourism before. 
Yeah, although I think they were mostly Scandinavians. <laughs> <laughs> Marxist Leninists that came to Albania were usually from Scandinavian factions who came and told us how horrible social democracy was. Yeah, and yes, yes. you know, this is a human wreckage is being done in, in Sweden and Denmark and <laughs> it we need to learn from Albania. Um, and these were actually the first tourists I remember meeting who, who would, we were told in school that we weren't allowed, wh whoever the tourists were, we weren't distinguishing between the good tourists. They were mm. usually the good tourists and the bad tourists. So the bad tourists were the ones that came with the exclusive tour operators. And the good tourists were the ones that came from these kind of sister and brother communist parties around the world. And both of them would come packed, we were told, with chewing gums, which we must not accept. Yes. And so in school I was told to refuse chewing gum that came from tourists. And all of them tried to give us chewing gum. Uh, and and so I remember this kind of constant... Why did you have to refuse it? I never understood that when I read the book. Well, we were told they were poisoned, but yeah. this was all part of the kind of crazy state propaganda, in part because they were worried about... because they had no control over what kind of tourists... like who exactly these tourists were and what we would say to them and so on. They just wanted to create this boundary. I have a chapter in the book called The Smell of Sound Cream, mm -hmm. which is the my most vivid and still very present sort of olfatic memory that I have is of this where we used to be at the beach and the beach had a trench that separated the tourist beach from the local beach and when you went into the tourist beach it they had sun cream but we didn't have sun cream in Albania it wasn't sold and so the whole beach smelled of sun cream and I remember I whenever we, we wouldn't say I saw a tourist we would say I smelled a tourist <laughs> because <laughs> because there was the sun cream that kind of made them really distinctive and kind of stand out so yeah going back to this uh, you just ask a bit more about it this uh, uh your fellow graduate student that was kind of not taking didn't think that your experience was relevant or the experience of real existing communists was relevant do you think that has something to do with the way political philosophy happened to be done at that time it was very much ideal theory there was like you know john rawls and robin nosik for that matter too w was it that that the you, you think about a very idealist mm -hmm. state rather than perhaps thinking about more concrete question about power and uh, like a uh, feasibility constraint or was it another just psychological reason i think it was really more actually the paternalism that also pervaded the left in western societies so i don't think we tend to think that only the liberal is paternalist and kind of has this neo-colonial mm -hmm. approach but i think actually the neo-colonial approach was in that dimension as much of the left as of the right and i mean i yeah, say this is someone from the left so i don't think it was to do with the particular methodology in political uh -huh. theory because also the ones that were interested in history of political thought or mm -hmm. were like marx scholars or hegel scholars or whatever it was the same thing and yeah so i think it really is about just assuming that you know of this context or maybe it makes it easier if you ignore the context and make it to yourself irrelevant theoretically so then, you can kind of then you don't have to know anything about it western so. arrogance basically well Seems i mean that. yeah i don't know I mean, i'm not usually like i don't want to give kind of bad adjectives because no. sometimes <laughs> these things are um, I do. <laughs> sometimes these things are in you know they're you can't avoid them are not unintentional um i think it's just easier to handle the world if, you if there's not too much complexity to it. So if you have to know about all the ins and outs of communist Albania mm -hmm. as a Westerner in Sweden or whatever, I mean, of course, you it's easier to say, well, this doesn't have anything to teach me. And this is also the difference between coming from a small country and being in a... I mean, in Sweden, in Sweden, in too many ways, a, a small country Very as well. But small country. Being <laughs> in a country, so you probably experience some something of this as well. You know about hegemonic states a lot mm. more than the hegemonic states know about you. So in Albania, people, it was an extremely isolated society. It was very, it was sealed off to the world and the world knew nothing about it. But Albanians knew a lot about the world because they were so small, because there was very severe censorship, because there was this drive to want to know more things that made them even more eager. I had this, I always give this example. I had this cousin who in communist Albania knew everything about Rome. So you would go to him and he would say, you know, he had these kind of stories about Rome. He'd say, you know, if you ever go to Rome, it's in a fantastic place. You get down at Roma Termini, then you walk towards Piazza della Repubblica, then you get to Piazza del Popolo, then there's this bar and then there's this restaurant and then this film is, is filmed here and so on. And I remember asking, so when did you go to Rome? He said, oh, I've never been. <laughs> I just, he kind of read about it and, and saw it in films and so on. Yeah. In fact, when he went to Rome after the communism fell, he said it was very disappointing. Because he had kind of constructed, but knew all the details, and he was right. Because then I went to study in Rome, and it was exactly how he had described it. So people learned about these contexts because they were so motivated to learn about something that was not accessible to them. And sometimes I feel 
in contexts where you take for granted freedom of speech or the access to information, that makes you less curious and mm -hmm. less kind of willing to 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 look out for information. And you kind of accept it. Okay, fine. You know, Russia Today is not accessible. That's okay. I I remember I got really annoyed when Russia Today was censored in the in the UK mm -hmm. when the war started because. I was like, well, I can make a decision whether this is propaganda or not propaganda. Why mm -hmm. is it not accessible to me? Mm. And and somehow everybody was like, of course, we must censor Russia today. And I, I mean, I was really in a minority, but felt very angry and kept kind of looking for which are the countries that haven't, because mm. I wanted to know what was being told to the Russians about their government and about the war and so on. And it's not that I felt that I didn't, have I didn't know right from wrong or that this information would make it very hard for me to say right from wrong, but I just wanted to know what is the alternative story being told mm -hmm. here and why can't I even have access to that alternative story. We so can talk about the long term, it's another thing of liberal freedom of speech versus propaganda and protection. Well, yeah, exactly, so right, right. But, but I mean, but I feel, you know, people have the tools to make these yeah, decisions. Yeah. It's the same thing with, you know, with uh, discussions that we have now about cancel culture or I don't know how much this is present in Sweden, but in, uh, uh, in Britain uh, there is a lot of this. The new Minister of Education first article he wrote was about cancel culture. There is culture. a lot of this. And I feel, you know, people have ma maturity and they can make these decisions. You don't have to make it so easy for them that they actually can't then even don't have to bring themselves to make these decisions because then it's paralyzing of, of thought. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to let the audience in, but um, I'm going to ask you a question you always get, so uh, you might be bored of it, but uh, people will So, given your experiences growing up in Albania during communist, I mean, you still would call yourself a Marxist and a socialist, might even a communist. How can you, how can that be? Yeah, well, I mean, so I, I, I say, I, do I call myself a Marxist or a socialist or a communist? I certainly don't have a problem being called that if mm. people are going to call me that because I, you know, I don't reject the label, let's say. Why? Because I think there is a part, as I said, of that intellectual tradition that I find productive to engage with. There is a part of the criticism of capitalism in those societies that I find very interesting. There is a theory of freedom that I find extremely attractive. And incidentally, that theory of freedom, I think, is also a theory of that of cr criticism of the state. So there is a kind of, I feel like I have an anarchist leaning in me where I think that the utopia of a, a, a state of a society where you don't have the authority of the state is an attractive one. And I know it's a utopia, but just because it's a utopia doesn't mean that you kind of, you can't pursue it. And I find productive to engage with these traditions in a way that forces me to push myself to think critically of society and of the society in which I live. And so I find, and, and so I don't reject the label, and especially in Albania, I mean, it's not that I think of all these theories as giants on the shoulders of which you have to climb, and I don't think, you know, of Marx as the Bible or any of these texts as the Bible, because you have to adapt them. They were texts that were written for a specific time and place, and you pick what's relevant, and you discard what's no longer relevant or historically obsolete, and then you use all of these as instruments. So in some ways, I don't like the label because I don't think of myself as a Marxist, because why would, it's like, you, if you're a liberal, you don't call yourself a Lockean or a million mm -hmm. or... Mm -hmm or anything like that. You don't associate yourself to one person. You, you associate don't call yourself, yourself a Dorvian, tradition. you know? Who calls himself a Dorvian? Not right, exactly. So yeah. you usually associate yourself to a tradition of thought rather mm. than an, an individual, which is a problem. I remember when I was hired at the LSE, they said to me, you have to teach Marxism. And I was like, well, I don't want to teach Marxism. You teach liberal theories of freedom, I'll teach socialist theories of freedom. And they're like, no, that wouldn't be good commercially. <laughs> we, we can't market that degree. <laughs> so I was stuck <laughs> teaching Marxism. But, but I've always hated the label. But I also, I hate it in the West, but appropriate it in the East, because I feel people also need to be provoked and to be told, look, you can, it's not, uh, yeah, it's uh, mm -hmm. not something that you, be, you have to be afraid of. And I don't think any philosophical figure is something that you have to be afraid of, or you kind of embrace thought and then see what you can do with it to understand the society in which you live. And all of us have a responsibility in that direction, and then what we call ourselves, I don't think it's that important. But What does your libertarian mom say about this? Um, <laughs> Well, she was actually asked recently on Albanian television what she thought about this. Oh my <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and she said, uh, well, I didn't like this book, but now it's won so many prizes. I guess there must be something good in it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, so, so that's what she said. <laughs> so she was like, the market has decided. It must be valuable. It's selling <laughs> the market, well. Exactly. Yeah, the market yeah, has yeah. given it a value. So I guess I'll, uh, I'll take the value. Yeah. <laughs> a short, very short question. You're working on a second book. What is that? So it's about dignity and uh, the, so the core concept, a bit like freedom is the mm -hmm. core concept here. I want the In the book we didn't talk about this, but there are several theories of freedom, one of which is the Kantian theory that freedom is moral agency. Mm -hmm. And the core of the Kantian 
freedom, uh, this kind of Kantian theory of freedom as moral agency is this idea of dignity of the human being. And so I'm trying to then unpack that kind of theory of freedom in the next book. But it's also, in methodological terms, a hybrid of a sort of family history, history, sociopolitical uh, politics. And, and who and won in the family? Which one in the family? My grandmother is ah. the kind of core character. So the book is set in the 1920s to mid-40s when the communists come to power and traces her life born in this kind of Ottoman Salonika, which was a cosmopolitan imperial city in many ways. And then um, she, was she was forced more or less to, to exit Salonika when you... At the in the aftermath of the Ottoman Empire, like the Habsburg Empire, you have this kind of birth of the nation state. And so suddenly communities have to have homogeneous identities. And she has to go to Albania because she's an Albanian. She can't live in Greece anymore because Greece is for the Greeks and so on. So the, s the book is all an effort to talk about dignity, both at the personal level in terms of you know dignity and identity and how do, you how do you find an identity, how do you think about identity, and also as a nation in terms of you know what does it mean to have independence in this world of nation states and how do these questions. And it's set in this interwar period because I think a lot of the discussions that we have now are all connected to these interwar debates, you know, the ideological clash between neo-fascism, within fascism and liberalism, the financial crisis, the kind of birth of radical, um, radical progressive movements and so on. I feel like that period historically speaks to where we are now. So I want to talk about the present, but in a way that isn't talking about the mm. present, it's talking about this other context. So it's all kind of set in the Balkans. And as I say, it's a family history. And a part of it is connected to, because she has all these secret service files in Albania, because uh, she was spied upon, a lot of it is based on archival research and recovering uh, the what the spies were saying about her. So it's both her thinking about the state, but also the state thinking about her. That's an advantage of spies, so you can get a lot of information. There is <laughs> a lot, although you'd be surprised how, how wrong, how many mistakes there are mm. actually in the spy files. And so this is another part of the book that's still developing about the fact that the spies themselves got confused. And uh, yeah, there are lots of mistakes. You think you go to the archives and you look at the secret service because you will find the truth. But actually what you find is just another interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, another story. Right. And another story, exactly. So that's kind of what the book is all about. We're looking forward to that. Well, so now I will open the floor for questions. I think we have a microphone. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, your book has uh, a lot of g good qualities and uh, the, the style, how it is written, etc. It's really fantastic. And uh, But why do you think the book has become such a huge success ju right now? Well, that's a good question. Why yeah. is it a huge success? That's the last know. question is a good question. I felt like, um, I, I really don't know. I mean, I'm kind of as puzzled as everyone is, to be honest. I don't really have a good answer. But I'm not puzzled. insofar as I'm, <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a lot of good books that get written <laughs> every every day. So I get easily <laughs> so bored. I don't feel like, you know, I'm, I think it's maybe something to do with the, it came out just after COVID. And COVID was a period where people were asking themselves questions about freedom and also how much they could take mm. for granted of the societies in which they lived. You know, this happened after there had been lockdowns in which all the freedoms that you were told, these are freedoms that you can't touch in Western liberal democracies, the freedom to associate, the freedom to walk for walk in the park or see your grandmother Chris for Christmas. I don't know how, you, it wasn't that severe, the lockdown here, but in Britain there were some really severe lockdowns. And, you know, all these things that you live in what you think is the heart of liberal society where there are some freedoms that will not be touched and they were and there was an emergency discourse that justified it and I think it made people somehow aware of this window of this gap between the theory of freedom and the practice of freedom and how sometimes you know even the institutions that you think are promising and delivering freedom won't always deliver and promise it so well they promise it but they won't always deliver it and I think it made people maybe aware of this gap as I say between ideology and or between appearance and essence as philosophers would say so maybe that's what's kind of contributed but I also feel there's there's par there's part of that there's another part of it which is in the book about family dynamics and it turns out family dynamics are not that different <laughs> around the world <laughs> so there is always you know a mom who is kind of nagging and a dad who is quietly <laughs> absorbing <laughs> or at least in eastern europe there seems to be a very strong uh, pattern of that kind of bossy moms and, <laughs> and quiet dads and so and then, and then this, of course, there's growing up under uh, a system. So sometimes I get these emails saying, I grew up in the Mormons in the US and I feel exactly the same like communist Albanian. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> but I think there is something about, you know, when you're pervaded by a doctrine in your upbringing and then you discover that you discover something else that also shapes you. And I think the book somehow tells that story. But I wish I knew what the success is because then I would apply to the next book. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, on that note, join me in thanking Leah for coming here talking about this lovely book Thank and you. writing this lovely Thanks. book. Thanks for coming.